Hi, and thanks for joining us for the final program in the series for gifted students in Year 6 and secondary students in Year 7 to 9, presented by Monash University and the Gifted Students Program. My name is Belinda Leeton, and I'm a student at Monash University. Today's program looks at why dinosaurs really didn't become extinct. During the program, there will be times when you can make contact with a team of presenters by telephone or fax. On behalf of everyone who has been involved with this series of three programs, I hope you have found them interesting, stimulating and enjoyable. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Pat Vickers-Rich from Monash University. You may think, you may be under the impression that dinosaurs are extinct, but if you take a look at my socks and you take a look at the morning paper with all the dinosaurs in it, maybe you'll begin to think that dinosaurs are still alive and everywhere. Dinosaurs actually are still alive, at least some of them, and they call themselves birds. And in today's program, we're going to look at many aspects of dinosaurs and why they didn't become extinct. We have three other people here besides me to talk about that. Leslie Cool from Monash University, who is a, the head preparator there. Lee Allen Rich, who is a Monash, a Monash, she is a Melbourne University student who is doing first year arts, and Tom Rich, who is curator of paleontology at the Museum of Victoria, each of whom will bring a different kind of view about dinosaurs, their names, why they didn't become extinct. So today's program we've divided into a couple of parts. The first part will look at the diversity of dinosaurs that existed between about uh, 180 million years ago and about 65 million years ago when most of the dinosaurs went extinct. Then we'll take a look at how those dinosaurs got their names and thirdly we'll take a look at the big extinction that occurred 65 million years ago at a time we call the KT boundary and then we'll look at the survivors that are still around. So to begin with, we will take a look at the number of different kinds of dinosaurs that were around between their most successful period, 180 million to about 65 million. And Leslie Cool, uh, from, who does preparation on most of these animals from Australia, will take a look at the variety here in Australia. There are many different kinds, they ate many different things, and in fact, if you think about people's concepts of dinosaurs being really unsuccessful. I hope by the end of this program you'll realize they've been around a lot longer than we have. They were very successful at doing things for tens and tens and tens of millions of years. So I don't think saying extinct as a dinosaur is a very nice thing to say about dinosaurs at all. So Leslie will give you an idea now of the variety of dinosaurs and their habits. Thanks, Pat. Well, compared with the rest of the world, Australia's dinosaur collection is very meager. However, here in Australia, we do have some number of kinds of dinosaurs, including the large sauropods, um, such as Ostrosaurus and Ratosaurus, whose bones have been found in Queensland. These were large plant-eating dinosaurs. And uh, as well as that, we also have an almost complete specimen of Mutaburosaurus, which was a large iguanodon-type dinosaur and was also a plant eater. Something that's interesting about those dinosaurs too, Leslie, and I think you can tell us a bit more about them, is what their headgear looked like and what that headgear might have been used for, you know, with all the horns and bumps and squiggles and things on their head? Yes, especially Mutaburosaurus. Uh, from the skull of Mutaburosaurus, it has these large uh, canals and cavities in the, in the nose region, which they they believe may have been used for uh, making sounds, for calling to other uh, types of their own species, or maybe even for uh, sounding alarm if there were, were predators around. Um, and I guess the most uh, common dinosaur bones that we find in Victoria belong to the smaller plant-eating dinosaurs, like the ankylosaurs, which was a little armoured dinosaur that had lots of uh, bony plates on its, in its skin to protect it from its prey. And the most successful dinosaur that we find here in Victoria is the Hypsilophodont, which again is uh, a little plant-eating dinosaur, a little, uh, used to run on its hind legs, which was probably its most efficient way of, of escaping from, uh, from the predators. And speaking of predators, I guess they're the most exciting dinosaurs that we, uh, that we like to discover. And uh, they're very rare in the fossil record because their bones don't preserve well. They are very thin, walled, hollow bones, very much like bird bones. And um, 
This is evident with something like Tyrannosaurus rex, and there are actually only about 12 specimens, complete or partial skeletons, of Tyrannosaurus rex in the world. When you think about that too, there are other reasons why predators tend to be very rare, and the reason that is is because predators are rare in the, if you look at the modern world, they're not as many lions as there are zebras and things like that, so not only are their bones very fragile, but their bones, are, they are individually very rare in the faunas. That's right. You would expect to find more plant-eating dinosaurs mm -hmm. who would maybe have congregated together in, in herds, whereas the uh, something like Allosaurus, for instance, that we find evidence of here in Australia. Allosaurus was a large dinosaur, and he probably um, went after the small dinosaurs either singly or, or maybe in, in one or two groups. But um, the most exciting group for us are the small theropod dinosaurs, the little meat-eating dinosaurs. And we have evidence here in Victoria um, of the uh, a type of dinosaur which may have looked like a velociraptor, which I'm sure anyone who's seen Jurassic Park will have a very good picture of. And uh, we have evidence of these, this little meat-eating dinosaur only by its teeth, which we find uh, at, down at Inverloch, scattered amongst the hypsilophodont bones. But they were here. Unfortunately, we haven't found any evidence of their, their bones as yet, because, like I say, their bones were very fragile. They were thin-walled. They were hollow, very much like a bird. And if you look at the, the skull of uh, the ornithomimid dinosaur on the, on the table here, you can see just how much like a bird these dinosaurs were. And in fact, here's a model of that same little dinosaur, which has been named after a person here in Victoria, another school, a schoolboy named Tim, Timimus. Uh, Lee Ellen will tell you about her dinosaur, but what Leslie might also point out is how you tell the difference between, say, in the femur, which is this bone here in our leg, between one of the little herbivores and one of the little carnivorous dinosaurs, the little, the, well, not so little, the, the Timimus. Yes, apart from the fact that they're very different in size, you can see that the little uh, plant-eating dinosaur bone um, was, had this little bony projection on the side of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the shaft, which was used for extra muscle attachment. So we know just by looking at that bone that this was a very fast-running dinosaur. This, this bone comes from the Timimus hermini uh, dinosaur that was found at Dinosaur Cove. And as you can see, it was a very long, thin bone. And the original bone uh, inside is very, very thin-walled. And it, it's actually been infilled with sediment. So um, the, where it was originally filled with air, it now has um, a lot of sand and, and mud inside. But you can see that it, it's a, from a very different type of dinosaur, something like the model that you see on the table with a very long, slender, gracile legs and very bird-like in its, in its shape. I think one thing that you tend to notice when you study all these dinosaurs, not only from Australia but also from the rest of the world, is that in the absence of mammals at that time in the size range that these dinosaurs were in, they filled a lot of the same jobs. They did many of the same things that mammals do today. The dinosaurs during the 180 to 65 million years ago were very successful and did many of the same kinds of jobs that mammals did. Until dinosaurs became extinct, mammals didn't move into those, into those jobs. So hopefully this has given you an idea now of the variety of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs really were during that time extremely successful and the most successful land-dwelling animals that we have. How were they named now? When did dinosaurs first come on the scene? Dinosaurs obviously were around a long time ago, but they really weren't recognized by human beings until the 1800s when a very famous anatomist called Sir Richard Owen, working in England, um, named the group. Their bones had been known from earlier in the century and they were collected by a doctor who took his buggy out to visit his patients. His wife often went with him and Mrs. Mantell got out and started picking up little bits of bone in the gravel on the roads and those bones turned out to be something very new. Sir Richard Owen was the one who actually put a name on them, Dinosauria, which meant terrible lizard. Some of them were pretty terrible, but none of them were lizards. However, that was the closest thing that was known at the time and so that's how they got their name. That's how the whole group got its name, but now when you start looking at individual names like Ty Tyrannosaurus rex, for instance, that name is made up of little bits. The little bits in the case of this, tyrant, tyrannosaurus. Tyrant means a tyrant, like a tyrant king or something of that sort. Saurus means lizard, and rex, of course, means king. So tyrannosaurus rex is a name that means the tyrant king of the, of the dinosaurs or the tyrant king of the lizards. 
Now, the dinosaurs also get their names in other ways. That tells something about this terrible, terrible dinosaur, but names are given on the basis of perhaps honoring people who've had something to do with the discovery of the dinosaur or a place a dinosaur came from or somebody who gave a lot of support to get those dinosaurs collected. And Lee Allen uh, Rich, who is at Melbourne University now, has been involved in a lot of this collecting and in fact has a dinosaur named after her, Lee Ellenosaura amica graphica. And I'd like her to give us an idea of why she had a dinosaur named after her and maybe an idea of how a couple of the other dinosaurs from here in Victoria were named. What's the reason, for instance, that there is a dinosaur called Atlas Copcosaurus? If you could start out with Leelanosaura and then tell us about Atlas Copcosaurus, that'd give you an idea of two names that have come in to being in the last 10 years on the basis of what she'll tell you. Right. Well, um, when I was two years old, I actually asked my father here. Um, um, I had read a book called My Little Dinosaur where a boy had a dinosaur named after him. And I decided with my two-year-old mind that I, I wanted one too. So I asked my father if he would find me a dinosaur because, of course, him being the dinosaur hunter he was could do this. Well, that's what I believed. Anyway, um, 10 years later, he actually did find a dinosaur and name it after me. and that was Leelanosaura. So, I mean, I'd been helping in the, helping out on the expeditions and stuff like that and my way into a little dinosaur naming exercise. And, um, and so I eventually got my own dinosaur named after me. Now, of course, um, that's not the only way um, to have a dinosaur named after you, um, or not the only way that dinosaurs get their names. Like um, Pat mentioned, there are, um, support groups that support the expeditions such as Atlas Copco and thus you have dinosaurs that turn out with names like Atlas Copcosaurus. Well Atlas Copcosaurus in fact is the first corporate dinosaur I know about and as Lee Allen said one of the reasons it's named after them is because they provided all the mining equipment for us for years and years and years not expecting anything in return except coming down and helping dig the dinosaurs. Lee Ellen's dinosaur has an interesting ending on her name. Most dinosaurs' names have Saurus, which is, if you look at the Latin base for that name, is a masculine ending, but hers is Sora. You want to give us an idea why we did that? Well, because I'm a girl. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also what she mentioned about place names, not in Victoria, but in Queensland, I believe, the Iguanodon, um, Mataburrosaurus, is named after a place that it was found, Mataburra, and so there is the place name Dinosaur. And also, just to finish up on this, Leelanosaura amica graphica is named, uh, the amica and graphica mean something. Amica is friends, refers to friend, and uh, graphica re refers to geographic. The reason we named it that is because the initial excavation down in the Otways was brought about because the friends of the Museum of Victoria were dying to go on a dinosaur dig. And so they went to Tom and they said, we want to go on a dinosaur dig, where can we go? And uh, in the end, they twisted his arm and off they went down to the first dig at Dinosaur Cove in the Otway Ranges where Leelanosaura was found. So we thought they needed to be honored by the fact that if it hadn't been for them, Leelanosaura probably would never have been found. Graphica goes to the National Geographic Society who has supported a lot of this work. So you can see that the names get put together in, in various ways. The final name I have to mention, or I'll be in big trouble when I go home tonight, is Tomimus, which Leslie has already mentioned. And this was a little dinosaur, the little um, Struthiomimid dinosaur that was found also at Dinosaur Cove. It was named after Leon's brother, who hasn't really done the field work yet that needs to be done in order to earn that name. But if I hadn't, if Tom and I hadn't named it, we would have had terrible family feuds. So <laughs> we now have that. Now, Tim's first question when we named that dinosaur is, can it eat the Leelanosaura? <laughs> and we said, no, Leelanosaura can run much too fast to be caught up by this. So I hope this gives you an idea of the names. Names come from many different places, and they usually are to honor a place or a group of people or tell you something about the dinosaurs that they are, uh, they are referring to. So you can see if you go out and find some material, you go out and hunt the, the shore platforms of Victoria or go anywhere in this continent and you find something new, if you bring it to a scientist, there's a chance you might have something named after you too. 
Now it's your chance to call in and ask us or fax in and ask us questions, which we'll do our best to answer. And after that, we'll go to the second part of our program, which looks at those dinosaurs that went extinct and those that didn't. Well, hello. We've got some questions here. Mark from Xavier Costa Hall, what's your question? Um, I would like to know how we would go about searching um, dinosaur bones at Dinosaur Cove. Well, I'll answer that question in two parts. One, I wouldn't go to Dinosaur Cove at all because it's very, very dangerous to get in there, and we've really pretty well got most of the bones out of there. But what you can do is go along the coastline from uh, Morn or any areas along the Otway Coast or around Inverloch and around that way and actually look in the rocks there. I'm going to tell Les ask Leslie to tell you specifically what you can look for. Thanks, Pat. Well, when you're down on the coast around Inverloch or around uh, Lawn, the, the rocks that you'll see are a grey type of sandstone. What you actually look for are the ancient river channels that are, are uh, in the in amongst the, the grey sandstone. And it's in amongst that, that, those river channels which have the wood and the, uh, the plant materials that you may hopefully find some bones. And if you do, please let us know. The bones have odd shapes and they're generally brown, so keep your eyeballs out for them. But be sure and get in touch with Leslie at Monash Uni because if you start trying to take them out, you'll probably end up with a handful of, a handful of nothing. Okay, we have another question. Thank you. Uh, John from, what's your question? John from Layla North. Hi. Um which is the oldest dinosaur ever found in Australia? Tom, could you answer that question? Well, we don't know what the oldest dinosaur is. We think it may be a dinosaur that was found up on Cape York. Um, we're looking right now to verify whether it really is a, uh, was from that site or not. But uh, other than that, we have some footprints that are about the same age. These are about 200 million years old. So we know dinosaurs were around here 200 million years ago. So that's a pretty long time ago. Another question from Jane at Warrigal PS. Um, how long ago did you find the Matabarasaurus? How am I going to define it? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, well, you, we basically have bones of that, of that animal, and you look at them, and you compare them with all other animals that look similar to it, and if it's got some differences, then you name it a new name, and that's what's happened with Matabarasaurus. So it means that you have to know a lot about bones all over the world before you can decide that you've got a new dinosaur. Thanks for that question. Another question from Kate at St. Francis. Um, uh, how can you tell the difference between a male and a female dinosaur? Oh, I'll give that to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way that people have done this is to, to look at the bones and the base of the tail. And that they find that the uh, males have got bones below the 
vertebral centrum, sort of a spike called a chevron bone, where the females don't for the first couple immediately behind the pelvis. And it's thought that these dinosaurs that didn't have these bones lack this uh, bone so that the eggs could pass out of the uh, female's body through that area. And it wouldn't be crunched by the processes on the vertebrae, so that's at least one theory. We have another question from Douglas at Camberwell. Hello. Hi. Uh, how did the dinosaurs that are still alive survive when the others didn't? That's a question that I don't think anybody has a particularly good answer for because um, some people have said that it's because they were warm-blooded and they could, bodily, they could regulate their body temperature, but there are a number of other dinosaurs that did go extinct that people think also regulated their, their body temperature. So I think that's a question that's yet unanswered and really, really interesting. Um, another question from Douglas. We've got two from Douglases at Camberwell. Is there a second Douglas at Camberwell? Uh, no, there's not two Douglases. Did you have two right. questions? But, um, Ben, from, also from Campbell, would like to ask a question. Okay, Ben. Hi, um, I'm Daniel Clay. Um, can dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period live through the Triassic and Jurassic periods? And if they don't, would they change shape and size? Generally, you find that the dinosaurs do change through time. There aren't any dinosaurs that lived in the Triassic that also lived in the Cretaceous, but there are some that were very similar. So some families, like the little Hypsilophodontids, actually lived pretty much all the way through that time, but individual species and genera didn't live on. Now I'm going to have to go to some of the faxes here. We've got a fax from Andrew at Layla North Primary School, and his question is, what is a theropod dinosaur? And I'll ask Leslie to answer that one. Well, theropod means beast foot, and it's a name that's given to the, the meat-eating dinosaurs, and these can, um, can vary from the small uh, dinosaurs like the Velociraptor or the Deinonychus right through to the, the larger dinosaurs like Allosaurus. So it just means beast foot and it, it describes the shape of the foot of these particular types of dinosaurs. And another question from Kelly at Layla North and her question is, in last week's show about mammal-like reptiles you said rocks could be dated. How can that be done? Tom, could you give us a short answer for that? <laughs> a short answer? That's a very difficult thing to do. Um, basically, what people do to give dates on uh, rocks is to look at the uh, radioactive elements and the uh, ratio of the various uh, isotopes of those elements to give an age estimate. It's sort of like uh, how you would uh, read an hourglass, only people look at individual atoms instead of uh, looking at sand grains. Okay, another question from uh, Catherine at uh, Warana Primary School and also from Kirsten, who was the earliest ancestor recorded of our birds today? Um, that's, a, again, a very curly question because there are many, many animals right on the borderline between uh, dinosaurs and birds that it's very difficult to say whether they're birds or dinosaurs. But one we looked at in this program is Archaeopteryx, and that is a, an animal that is kind of in that gray area. It's half, half uh, theropod dinosaur and half bird. So that would probably be one of the oldest that we've got. Another question from Prudence at Laristo. Hi, Hi. I was wondering what would happen if a dinosaur ate another dinosaur and the bone didn't deteriorate and, um, the, bo and the bones are still inside, would you still be able to get them? Some, in some cases that's actually happened. As long as digestion hasn't gone too far, you can actually get bones inside another skeleton. In some cases too, and not in dinosaurs, but in some animals called ichthyosaurs, you actually, it looks like they gave live birth. They were reptiles. They gave live birth to their young. And so little baby skeletons have been found inside the mothers. So that's kind of really exciting when you find things like that. Another question from Ismail and Dandan. And Dandan? Are you there, Ismail? No, well, we'll go on to another question from a fax. Um, if dinosaurs are relatives of birds and dinosaurs can't fly, how do dinosaurs evolve into animals which can fly? This is from Scott at Layla North Primary School. It takes a while to do that, but in fact the theory is with regard to that, that the, uh, some of these little ground-dwelling dinosaurs that were running along pretty fast actually began to use their arms as insect nets to try grabbing insects that they were chasing and that the feathers then uh, there was a selection for, a preference for, in the offspring generation after generation for those feathers to get larger and larger. That's one theory. There are lots of others. But once the feathers got to a certain size, the animals, by chance, might have just jumped into the air and found that they could essentially glide. That sounds very simplistic, but there are many ideas that can be developed along those lines to show the steps that would lead from an animal that didn't fly to one that did. 
A lot of them probably died in the process and weren't very successful. There were probably a lot of crashes along the way. But there were a few of them that actually got through, and those are the ones that we know. OK, we have another fax here from uh, McAllister Secondary College. This is from, no, it's from McAllister Secondary College Sale, Robert, Justin, and Pinchy. How can you tell if a dinosaur is a herbivore or a carnivore? I'll give that to Leslie. Well, you can tell by uh, looking, simply looking at their teeth. Uh, the teeth of herbivore dinosaurs are very specialized for cutting through the, the plant material which they ate. And if you look at the teeth of um, a theropod or meat-eating dinosaur, you will see that they had very pointed, sharp teeth with serrations on them, which were ideal for slicing through dinosaur flesh. Okay, we have another uh, call from Liam at Camberwell. Liam, what's your question? We've lost... Oh, are you there? Have any dinosaurs been named after really famous people like um, Michael Jackson and stuff? Lee Allen, can I give you that question? <laughs> I don't really know. Um. Well, actually, there is one that I just heard about. It's, not, it's a turtle and not a dinosaur, but it doesn't really make too much difference. There's a turtle that's been named after Terry Patchett. I don't know if you know the stories that he's written about... Uh, Oh, these the, sto dis -world. the disc world stories, but there there are people. I can't think of one just now, but there certainly are a number of Gary famous. Larson Gary Larson. Gary Larson has yeah. a dinosaur named after him. Ninja, so that's Ninja Maze. Oh, Ninja Maze is another thing. So there is a few. Now, Ismail, are you there from Danny Nome? Ismail. We've lost Ismail. Ismail. Okay, we'll go on to St. Simon's Primary School. And this is from, um, it doesn't say who it's from, but it, uh, it's got a question. How does the sand and mud get into the hollow bones? Oh, that's from Luke. Okay, Leslie, would you like to answer that? Well, when the bones um, are originally uh, buried in the sediments and the mud and the sand, if the bones are cracked, then the sand and the mud will get into the hollow parts of the bone, and that's how they, they end up being infilled. And another question from that school from Luke, how do, what does the KT boundary mean? Well, the K stands for Cretaceous and the T stands for tertiary. They're two big chunks of time and that just basically is the boundary between those two big chunks of time and that's about 65 million years ago. We have a question from Hugh at Hampton Park that's just come through. Hugh? Are dinosaurs more related to birds than reptiles? Oh, that's an interesting question. Dinosaurs are reptiles, but they're related to birds. So I don't know what you're going to make out of that, but <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Okay, another question here from Stacy at Lake Charm Primary School. How many dinosaur-like birds have been found from all over the world? That changes every day, Stacy, because this is, right now, is the time, the last couple of years, the time when most of these have been found. There's a lot of them showing up in China, and in South America and in Europe and these are all being described so if I told you right now that there were about 15 tomorrow there'd probably be 17 there's a lot of work going on in this area um, a question from Tim at Camberwell um, I'd like to know why were the dinosaurs extinct why were they extinct yes um, because they didn't occur after 65 million years ago except for birds and Tom, on the last program, would have talked in detail about the theories of extinction. So if you can go back and get that program to look at again, we go through all the theories. Thanks for that question. Another one from McAllister Secondary College. What evidence do you have to show that dinosaurs are related to birds? I'll just refer you back to the, the earlier part of this program because that question is really looked at, and it's basically looking at the bones and comparing them very closely. Another one from, let's see, from Sale, McAllister Secondary College. Uh, how many known species of dinosaurs are there? I'll give that one to Tom. Well, there's about 300. We have actually 300 what we call genera, which is a higher name, like Tyrannosaurus is a genus and Rex is a species. But most genera of dinosaurs have only one species, so it's probably about three to 500. Okay, we are going to have to wind up now, and those questions have been absolutely terrific. Some of them are really making us think here. So save some up for the next time, and if you've got faxes you want to send in, send them in during the next bit of the program. We'll go back to the second part of the program now. Thanks for all those great questions. And now we're back into the second part of this program where we'd like to investigate the dinosaurs that became extinct and why they became extinct. And then we'll look at some of the dinosaurs that didn't become extinct. I'd like to ask Tom Rich, who's the curator of paleontology at the Museum of Victoria, to just go through a couple or three of the ideas of why dinosaurs 
went extinct 65 million years ago, at least most of them. There are several theories. All of these theories may be correct. Some of them may be correct, and maybe in the end none of them are correct, but it's at a very, very interesting stage in scientific argument at the moment about why dinosaurs went extinct and also why a lot of other things went extinct at this famous KT boundary. So, Tom, could you give us some idea of the theories that are being batted around at the moment about why things got in big trouble 65 million years ago? Well, thank you, Pat. Um, the reason that we think that dinosaurs became extinct are centered basically around two ideas at the moment. Mainly the idea that there was a major impact by either a comet or an asteroid, probably in the area of eastern Mexico. And the other is that there may have been massive volcanic, volcanic activity in western India. Now it just could happen that the two events are somehow related. Well, how is this so? If you look at where the continents were at the time of the KT boundary 65 million years ago, India is just about opposite Mexico because India was far south of its present position. And it's possible that as the uh, asteroid or comet hit Mexico, an earthquake, a giant earthquake such as we've never seen before on Earth, passed through the whole globe. And when the waves focused on the opposite side of the globe, India was given a real shake and it looks like when we look at the volcanic activity there, there's a sudden spurt or increase in the volcanic activity just at that time. Because within the volcanic rocks, you find beds of sediments in which you find dinosaur bones in the lower part of the pile of volcanic rocks. But as you go up in time and, and the volcanic activity increased greatly, the dinosaurs are no longer found in the uh, sedimentary rocks that occur within the volcanic basalts. So it seems that that is just the time when they go extinct. So these two events may actually be linked together. Well now, uh, how does that affect and make dinosaurs go extinct? You've got a lot of volcanism, you've got a lot of garbage up in the air, a lot of particulate matter. What does that do to the whole world environment that makes dinosaurs not very happy or other things not very happy? Well presumably there would have been a lot of uh, stress at that time because there would have been a lot of uh, nitric oxide release which would have made a lot of uh, acids. Uh, there would have been ash thrown up in the air, possibly due to forest fires, also there would have been a lot of volcanic dust. So in other words, it would have been acid rain, the thing that we talk about and hear about that we're causing with our emissions. You would have also had the world cooling because there was a lot of dust in the air and so the incoming light would have basically been cut down, so it would have cooled. Um, wouldn't have been a very nice place. Forest fires then in themselves would have, uh, would have wiped out lots of things in their wake. And I guess the reason we know there were forest fires is there are a lot of charcoal layers at that time. So, That's correct. Yeah. And um, what you find is that some groups get through. For example, the mammals and the birds survive. But as far as we can tell with the mammals, for example, that a lot of groups do dry out just at that time. For example, in North America, the marsupials, which are related to things like the kangaroos and wombats here in Australia, almost go extinct. There's only one or two forms that get through. So a lot of groups died back, although some of their uh, descendants then flowered into the rather diverse groups we see 10 million years later. So a lot of groups nearly went extinct, and other groups went totally extinct. And the fact that we have the things we do on Earth today seems to be those groups of which a few members at least survived then gave rise to a very great flowering of animals that were to evolve in the next five to ten million years. So there are a lot of people at the moment thinking about this problem and trying to understand, and I think you can imagine why, who's, why certain things survived. What were the characteristics of the surviving animals across that boundary? Nobody has any answers at the moment, but it's a very interesting thing to be looking at. And I think it's why a lot of paleontologists do what they do, because they can look at events like this, things that have really happened, and look at major extinctions and try to figure out what groups went across that boundary and survived extinction uh, and what we can learn from that. I think that's a very interesting point to be considering. So hopefully, as Tom has explained, you can understand that there are people who support an idea of a big extraterrestrial object coming in, plowing into the earth, releasing a lot of energy, putting a lot of garbage up in the air that cools, helps cool the earth off and that affects climate. There are other people who believe and have suggested, they don't believe, they've suggested that increased volcanism at that time may have been doing much the same thing. There are a third group of people that suggest that all these things relate, that maybe both of these ideas are interrelated. 
And there are lots of other theories that have a little less credibility, like some extraterrestrial Martian came in and zapped out all the dinosaurs, or that some terrible disease wiped things out, but many of these theories don't seem to have an awful lot of credibility. Um, so that's where we are in the thinking of this big extinction at the end of at 65 million years ago. Uh, those two theories have a lot of credibility and there is probably a great deal of truth to them. But what I'd like to look at briefly now is the fact that they're at one of these survivors. Uh, Tom mentioned already that there were survivors of mammals, there were survivals of certainly of things like turtles and crocodiles and a lot of plants got across that boundary. Plants didn't seem to be particularly as affected as the vertebrates, but they were affected. But the dinosaurs actually survived that boundary and the, the surviving dinosaurs are birds. I always like to think, because I started out as an ornithologist, that I really was on the right trail early in my life and that I can go dinosaur watching. We can take our binoculars and go out dinosaur watching. <laughs> One of the critical factors in understanding that they did survive was, uh, were a series of fossils that have been found particularly in places like Germany and South America that show very close um, shapes of the bones and of the skeletons between early birds and things like Allosaurus, some of these theropod dinosaurs. And here on the table we have one specimen that uh, there are about six specimens in the world now known of, of a form called Archaeopteryx, which is a very interesting little animal. Many people have said, who have studied these specimens, that if it didn't have feathers attached to it, that it would have been classified as a little dinosaur. It has a skull here, which has very well-developed teeth. It has a very long tail that have bones uh, all the way to the end of the tail. Those are not just feathers. And the whole structure, when you begin looking at the, how the skull is put together, is very, very similar to something like Allosaurus and other related theropods or uh, beast-footed dinosaurs, things like T. rex and things like many of the animals that are present in the Great Russian Dinosaur Exhibition that we have footage of here. Now, scientists looking at this, look at all this morphological detail, the detail of the bones, the detail of the teeth, the detail of this little bone here in particular called a, and, it, and it's a big long name, but I'm sure you'll remember it, a tarso metatarsus, which means, if you think again about my socks, it's the bones in your ankle. It's the bones down here. Those are your tarsals and the metatarsals, which are in this part of your foot. Now, in birds, and in advanced theropod dinosaurs, those bones, and this is just an example of one of the advanced theropod dinosaurs, those tarsals, which are there are, the tarsals are up here, and the metatarsals, there's one, two, three here, they're all very close to one another, and in some forms they begin to fuse, and in birds they are fused, although in this little intermediate, Archaeopteryx, they are still separate. So that's one example of where you can see the change going on from animals that have separate metatarsals to animals that have that fusion, and then all the later birds have that kind of fusion. That's a bit of detail, but that's the kind of thing that a paleontologist has to look at to try seeing the steps that lead from one group of animals to another. So we, in looking at that detail, in looking at Archaeopteryx, in looking at some of the advanced uh, beast-footed dinosaurs, Allosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, and all of those, you can see a series of steps going from theropod dinosaurs to birds. That transition seems to have been a transition related to body temperature regulation. We think that some of the dinosaurs, like Allosaurus and some of the theropods, may actually have been regulating their body temperature. They might, might have been controlling it. We don't know that. A lot of people are working on it. But we do know that birds regulate their body temperature in many ways like we do. They're warm-blooded animals. And the feathers that developed on the earliest birds that we know that essentially look like feather-covered theropod dinosaurs was probably related to body temperature regulation. Feathers are really excellent insulators. And so if you have a covering of feathers or fur in the case of mammals, if you're generating heat, then you can maintain that heat. The feathers then, later, most people think, developed into things used for flight. But the initial feather development on these little theropod-like birds was probably related to keeping them nice and toasty warm and giving them the ability to act and do whatever they had to do, to eat, to breed, to feed, to whatever, 
uh, at any time they wanted to rather than being dependent on just being out in the daytime. So I think we ought to be glad some of the dinosaurs survived and perhaps from this program you have learned a little bit about not only why some survived but how they lived and how really successful dinosaurs were. So I would suggest never using the term dinosaur as a term of failure, but of something that's very, very much a success. And being dead as a dinosaur is a statement you would never want to say because they obviously are still alive. That brings us to the, the end of this section of our program, and I hope now that you will call in and ask us as many really, really serious and complicated questions as you possibly can, and we'll do our very best to answer. So we're here waiting for you to call or fax us. Well, welcome back, and we have a whole raft of questions waiting for us. Miles from Xavier, what's your question, Miles? Hello, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for the programs, and we've enjoyed them. And also, we've got a few questions. Okay, can you kind of limit it to two, because we're really stacked up oh, with questions. Yes, okay. Good. Um, the first one, are dinosaurs related in any way to human beings? Only in that they all have backbones, but their whole history, the mammal-like reptiles we talked about last time are very much more closer to human beings than dinosaurs are. They kind of went their separate ways. Now, what's your second question? Um, which type of bird is the most closely related to the dinosaur? The birds that are around today are all really pretty advanced, so that the ones that are closely related dinosaurs themselves have all become extinct. But the little bird that we talked about just in this last segment, Archaeopteryx, that's one of the very closest. It's long extinct, but that's one of the closest to dinosaurs. Okay, thanks for the program. Yeah, and thank you for your questions. We've got Miles, no, we've done Miles, Kelly from Stratford. Hello, we would like to know whether dinosaurs lived everywhere over the world, even in Antarctic. And the answer to that is yes. We've got dinosaurs from just about every place there is in the world. Maybe not really a great record, but there's even dinosaurs known from the main continent of Antarctica and also the western part of Antarctica. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Stephen from St. Francis? Um, hello. Hi. Um, thank you for the program, and this is my question. Mm -hmm. What are the last names of the Australian dinosaurs? The very youngest ones, or the ones that are on this program? Um, the ones that were on the program. Uh, the ones that were on the program, Leslie talked about hip hypsilophodonts, Lielinosaura, Amicographica is one of those hypsilophodonts, and Tamimus is the little uh, Struthiomima dinosaur. Those were two that we mentioned. Okay? Yep. Okay, Tim from St. Augustine. Um, I, I was just wondering, how can, how can they tell through the bones what colour dinosaurs were? They really don't have a clue, but the only thing, and we have another question that Lee Ellen was going to uh, address, you simply have got, well maybe I'll let Lee Ellen answer this question, how do you tell the color of a dinosaur? Oh, we can't actually tell the color of a dinosaur because color doesn't preserve, but we've got skin impressions and um, like we just have to assume that and compare like between reptiles today that would have similar behaviors and try to um, draw some conclusion from that. Yeah, that's about all. So we really don't know. And if you can invent a time machine and take us back there, we would really appreciate it. Tim, thanks for the question. I've got one more question. Yep. Um, Mammal-like reptiles seem many ways to be more advanced than dinosaurs. So why did they die out before the dinosaur? Well, in actual fact, they didn't die out. They existed alongside them for quite a long time. But they evolved into mammals, and mammals, of course, survived the dinosaurs. So the mammal-like reptiles, in a sense, didn't go extinct, but gave rise to another group, which then became much more successful. Okay, thanks for that question. Uh, we have uh, Stuart from Ringwood. Um, how long did an um, individual dinosaur live? 
Individual dinosaurs live for varying amounts of time. Some of the small ones probably had very short lifetimes, like in a matter of years, but some of the big ones, like the big sauropods, probably lived over 100 years. So it depends upon the dinosaur you're talking about. Thanks for that question. We're going to go to the faxes now. Tom has got a, a several faxes. He'll answer a few questions, and then we'll come to Leslie. Uh, the first one is from Nikki at Hampton Park East Primary School. Why is Australia one of the most unknown places in the world for the discovery of dinosaur bones? That's a very good question and one that Pat and I have been struggling with for the last 20 years. Basically, the problem is that we don't have the right age rocks very widely exposed on this continent. We have much older rocks, generally, and much younger rocks, but rocks for the age of dinosaurs are very rare. Okay, thanks for that. And do you have one more question there? Um, this one is from Rachel at Melton West Primary School, and what is the oldest mammal-like reptile you've ever found? Well, I have never found a mammal-like reptile, but the oldest mammal-like reptile found is about 320 million years ago. Okay, and Leslie, you have a couple of questions there? Yes, I have a, a question from Natasha from Hampton Park East Primary School. She says, uh, she asks, when was the first dinosaur found in Australia? Well, one of the very first dinosaur bones to be found in Australia was actually found in Victoria uh, at Cape Patterson near, um, near Imberlock, and it was a small dinosaur claw that was found by uh, a geologist at the, the end of the, 20th century, uh, the 19th century, by 1899. So that was one of the very first to be found. And I have a question from Travis, also from Hampton Park East, who wants to know how long does it take to put a big dinosaur together? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, Travis, because it, um, it can take a very long time. First of all, the bones have to be uh, removed from the rock. Then we have to build um, a frame to put the, the, the bones on so that in a lifelike position. And then we have to mount the bones. So it could take one person up to a year to, to put together a complete dinosaur. And Lee Ellen has a couple of questions there, if she could answer those. Yep, from Jessica at Dandenong North, have you found any dinosaurs yourself? And the answer is yes, I've found bits of dinosaurs, but like um, most people who um, look for dinosaurs, I haven't been lucky enough to find a, like a complete skeleton. But um, it's been very fun um, looking for them. And from Daniel, also from Dandenong North, um, are all dinosaurs named after people and places? Um, no, there's definitely dinosaurs that are named for things like their characteristics, like their hypsilophodontids, which are named for, hypsilophodontid means um, high crown tooth, so they're named for a particular characteristic about them. Okay, we have some phone calls coming through. Ismail from Danny Nong, are you there? Can you please tell me which was the first dinosaur discovered by uh, Sir Richard Owen? One of the first dinosaurs discovered by Sir Richard Owen, well, one of those would have been Iguanodon, which is a, a little, an animal that has a great big spike on its, uh, on its fingers. So that's one of the first ones that he would have described. Um, I have another question from David at Hampton Park. Um, I've got two questions. OK. Um, if all the countries were connected, then why didn't the dinosaurs, like, why didn't they all go all over the world? Why did they just stay in one place? Because there's other things controlling dinosaur movement besides just physical contact, like there were forests and mountains and different kinds of climates, so that really restricts their movement. And then your second question? Um, you know how early in the show you said you found like a raptor-like dinosaur? Mm -hmm. How could you tell that it was a raptor-like dinosaur well, just I'll by looking at its teeth? Okay, I'll give that to Leslie. We can tell uh, just by looking at its teeth. That if you look at um, any meat-eating dinosaur, you'll see that the, their teeth are all very similar. This, they're this triangular shaped with uh, a point and serrations <coughs> on them. And these teeth were designed specifically for biting into, into flesh. So just by finding one tooth, we know that that, that animal was a, a meat-eating dinosaur. OK, we have uh, some more faxes coming in. We'll take a look at this. This is from uh, Catholic Co uh, College in Bendigo. And the question is from Verity and Sarah. How do the people who, make Jura who made Jurassic Park know that the Velociraptor attack in pairs from, from the sides? They really don't know that. The only reason that they think Velociraptor may have been uh, a packing animal is that they sometimes can find their skeletons together. But they're really, again, it's unless you have a time machine and go back, in time and look at this, you really can't tell that. It's only just from circumstantial evidence that's found in the rocks. Another question, has Pat ever had a dinosaur named after her? This is from Alana and Christy. I've not had a dinosaur named after me, but I've had a worm and a fish named after me, so I'm really pleased with those names. And another question, is a crocodile and a dinosaur, is a crocodile a dinosaur or not from Brad 
they're very different groups. They've come from the same kind of ancient ancestry. They have the same kinds of basic skull structure in those holes in the back of the head that we talked about before, but they had a long history separate from one another. They went on their own separate paths. Now we have a question on a phone call from Catherine. I don't know where she's from. Hello. Hi. Um, about how many species are there in the world? Oh, my goodness. Uh, of dinosaurs or of everything? Oh, dinosaurs. Right. Uh, Tom answered that question, I think, something over 300 different species. But that really varies a lot depending upon what book you read because, as I said, there's lots of research going on and there's a dinosaur discovered at least once a week, a new dinosaur, and sometimes that more often than that. So that number just keeps growing. Okay, thanks for that. We have some more faxes here. <clears throat> what does the K in the KT boundary stand for? Why does it stand for Cretaceous when Cretaceous starts with a C? And that's a very good question. Um, the K and the T are symbols for particular ages on the geologic time scale, and it just so happens that the geologists who named the Cretaceous used K. The reason they used K for the symbol was because there's another time period called the Cambrian, which starts with a C, and the C symbol is used for Cambrian, so they had to use something else. Okay. Tom, do you have a couple more questions on the faxes there? Yes, I have one. Um, what is the area of Dinosaur Cove? I think this refers to where is Dinosaur Cove. Dinosaur Cove is northwest of uh, Cape Otway on the coast, about 17 kilometers. Okay. Well, this is a real good question. It says, how do dinosaurs mate? This is from Ben Hill at St. Joseph's in Yachuca. Well, I'd say they've mated very carefully. Uh, it would depend, of course, I would imagine, on whether you were a herbivore or a carnivore, and I would imagine if you were a carnivore, you would think, if you were the male, you would think very carefully about what you were doing. <laughs> so other than that, I have no direct observations. Another question is, why do dinosaurs, what do they do all day? Again, I can't go back and watch, but I suspect that they do a lot of the same kind, did a lot of the same kinds of things that lizards and some mammals do. I mean, they ate and they slept and they probably went looking for a mate and they probably got up to mischief at some time. But <laughs> it's really um, something that we don't have any direct observations on. The only thing that I guess you could, you could contemplate is that some of them were warm-blooded, some of them were cold-blooded, and the models that you would use to decide what they did would have to depend upon the, the modern things that you can observe that are cold-blooded and warm-blooded. And a final question from there is, how do you tell the color of dinosaur skin? Lee Allen has already answered that question. Do you have some, another fax there, Leslie? No, no you're through. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom does? Yeah. If the cause of death was from volcanic activity, then how can their bones be so well preserved after s severe burns? Um, the cause of death might have been volcanic activity, but they could have been asphyxiated due to the flow of ash. And they could have been buried in ash. And sometimes you get very exquisitely preserved fossils in ash. Okay, a final question that we're going to have comes from St. Joseph's in Yachuca from Ben Sanderson. How come they have such long names? Some of them actually have quite short names, but one name that I happen to think that would be appropriate to mention is the name that was given to a stegosaur just recently, a Chinese stegosaur, uh, after all of the major characters that played in Jurassic Park. That's a very long name. It's just the first letters of their names. And uh, so that name is long simply because it was made up, that was put together with all those names uh, added on. And the reason was that Steven Spielberg gave the Chinese a fair bit of money to run the expedition to uh, discover those things. So names can be short or long. There are a few phone calls coming through. Tim from Nong North, we've heard from you before. What's your next question? Um, in the extinction of the dinosaurs, wouldn't the sea dinosaurs be safe from it? Uh, there's not, uh, there aren't any sea dinosaurs in the sense there are marine reptiles, but there were lots of things in the oceans that were affected too because the temperature of the ocean, of course, was affected by the same climatic changes that were happening on land. Now, I guess we're just about, uh, we've got one more question we can take. Catherine from St. Paul's. Um, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, how did you know that the dinosaurs had feathers? Well, the only, we don't know that any dinosaur had feathers. We know Archaeopteryx, which is a very dinosaur bird intermediate. It had feathers because we have the impressions of feathers. And that's the only way we know, is if we have impressions of those feathers. So we're going to have to uh, wind up now. I want to thank you for all your absolutely brilliant questions. We've answered many things to you by post because we couldn't answer everything that we got on, on screen. This is the last of the, uh, the programs from Monash and the Distance Education. There will be more next year, so we hope to see you back again next year. And it's been a real enjoyable time having these programs. Bye for now. <laughs>